Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Dell Tech. Today's topic is Earn Value Management in 2020. So we'll be taking a little trip on a time machine today and talking about what we believe and what we've discussed with industry and government um, is the future of Earn Value Um, on the line with me today, um, I have a couple of other folks um, that I'll be introducing. My name's Tom Pollan. I'm the Director of Solutions Architecture at Dell Tech. On the line today as well, I have Andrew Dorsey. He's going to introduce himself in a moment. And I'm going to go to this next slide and talk about the control panel and how we can have an interactive session today um, and, and be able to answer your questions. Uh, manning the question line today is Brad Arterbury. Um, he's a principal sales engineer at Dell Tech, and he'll be monitoring the chat window. Um, up on the screen, I've put your uh, GoToWebinar control panel, so hopefully you have something that looks just like this on your screen right now. And you can minimize this to get it out of the way and see more of your uh, on-screen real estate of what we'll be sharing. Also, you can ask questions throughout the session. You don't need to wait until the end. Brad will be monitoring the chat window, and he might even answer some questions as we go. And then at the end, as we have time, I'll turn it over to Brad, and he'll ask some of the most popular questions that have come up during the session. We'll attempt to answer them and, and leave everyone happy. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get moving here. We've got a lot to cover today, and, uh, and we've got a lot of you on the line, so we really want to um, really move along and make things good today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, the, I'm Tom Poland. I'm the direct, Director of Solutions Architecture um, here at Dell Tech. Now, on the line, I've got Andrew Dorsey from Raytheon. Andy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Andy Dorsey. I'm the uh, Earn Value Excellence Manager for Raytheon's um, integra integrated or IDS business unit as part of our global integrated sensors product line. Um, I'm responsible for partnering with our earned value management programs and uh, working with them to make sure that they implement earned value as a best practice and then partnering with them as part of their uh, joint surveillance uh, review audits uh, with DCMA. Prior to joining IDS out here in the greater Boston area, I was down in Florida where I was with our network centric systems business unit and I uh, worked as an earned value uh, manager for uh, multiple regions, including Florida, Texas, and uh, California. Cool. Well, thanks, Andy. Let's see. I've, I've been doing this for about 18 years. You're not too far behind. You've been doing this for close to 10 years now? So about uh, 10 years now, yes. Terrific. Okay. Andy, do you want to um, take it for, for a minute and talk about um, what we were after when we put this concept together? Yeah, Tom. The um, concept I, I, we kind of built upon an earlier uh, model that you had developed or presentation that you had done where you had looked at where the industry was heading at some conferences and some papers that you put together. Um, but this was really something that you did just on your own as part of your views of where the industry was going. And so we expanded it this year as to taking the idea of where is earned value going in the next, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to where it's going to be in, in the 2020s. And what we did a little bit different is instead of just giving our views, we partnered with some thought leaders in the industry, which we'll go on the next slide, and kind of asked their opinions on where the industry was going. Because a lot of them have been in, a, in the industry for a long time. They, they have a lot of ideas. They, they, they present themselves on different topics. So we, we sat down with each one of them on the phone for about an hour, hour and a half, and, and asked them some questions and some free form to, to get their idea of where the industry was heading. Um, and then we we put we presented at a workshop at the um, fall, no the spring EV spring World conference, yeah. yes uh, conference in Naples, Florida, and we had a workshop there for about an hour and a half where about 20 25 people in the room we shared the the, the thoughts that we'd gathered as part of our present as our interviews and they built upon them themselves and that's this culmination of this presentation is going to kind of bring together both the respondents from the EV World session and the thought leader interviews that we did. Yeah, Andy, and, and I think your idea of the workshop was, was a great idea. Uh, to give a little bit of background, back in 2005, I had a presentation that I was carrying around called Earn Value Management 2014. And as, as we got closer to 2014, uh, the, the, the vision was in the right place, 
but it wasn't a collaborative. It, it was it was something that myself and a few others had had put together, um, kind of in a vacuum, and it was just kind of a speculative exercise. And Andy, I think your idea with the workshop worked very well to turn that same thinking from a speculative exercise into a real active exercise. So let's go ahead and put these names up on the on the board. As Andy mentioned, we talked to various folks from government and industry um, for at least um, an hour each. And uh, Andy, I'll have you share your thoughts in a minute. But the one thing that um, I, I, w I was totally blown away by was the the seriousness and the amount of time that each of these individuals were willing to spend with us. In fact, um, you know, some of these uh, some of these folks here on the screen, you know, they're very high up. They can be very hard to come by. But it was almost like when when we framed the topic for them, um, things went from uh, a, a transactional type discussion to these real intense brainstorming, free flowing discussions. In a couple instances, uh, when we had run out of time, they'd said, "No, we'll spend more time either right now or we'll do a follow up session." And we hadn't even asked for uh, for more time. So, Andy, tell uh, tell everyone how we started here and how we how we worked this process. Well, we started this uh, earlier in the year at a uh, NDI PMSC um, meeting. Um, once. We started with a, a, a um, conference earlier in January in Clearwater, and I talked to jo uh, to Gary Humphreys with Humphreys and Associate, kind of framed the idea with him, and uh, he thought it was a great idea. And uh, we we followed up with some calls with him and Joe Cusick, the director from uh, Earned Value Resource Center with Raytheon, who I work with occasionally, and they both independently really supported it, um, gave us a lot of uh, advice and some direction, and they they recommended names, and they both recommended some very similar names. You know, first we got uh, Gerald Kirby with uh, NASA EBM program um, ex uh, ex executive, and also Dave Burgess, director of cost analyst uh, department for NavAir. And with both of these people, we both seen them and talked to them at, at different conferences, and uh, they they both were very eager and um, very responsive. And then of course from the from the government regulatory side, Jim Henderson with DCMA and Gordon Kranz of Parca. And what I was most amazed about was the fact that I just sent these people emails uh, with the with the topic what we wanted to talk about, and they both all of them responded very quickly. So um, it kind of caught on and got a, a life of its own, and everybody was very responsive and very happy to uh, to talk to us. And you know, and that was amazing, and and it demonstrated that this is something that people are interested in. It's something, and they themselves said we don't have time to think this way on a daily basis. And you know, not to be self-congratulatory, but they thanked us for 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 pausing, for taking time out of the regular cycle of the industry. These guys have validations, they have monthly reports, you know, and and projects that they're involved in, and they all appreciated the opportunity to step aside, go to the hundred thousand foot level, forget about forty thousand feet, go to the hundred thousand foot level, and really look down and see where we're headed. And I think everyone agreed if things look the same in 2020. As they do today, or even 10 years ago, we haven't done what it is that we should should be doing. Now, now came the next step was to really start to define what that roadmap to 2020 would look like. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, developed some key topics uh, to kind of frame the, the discussion points with each of the um, people that we spoke to. And the first one that we we put together was the technology, you know, and that's a key component of the the framework that we work on here with within the urban value community and we wanted to look at how are we going to interact with the data and tools in in the year 2020 um, and some of the topics that we developed on are, are the will the interfaces evolve or revolve around the data that we're looking at is compliance um, going to evolve into compliance prevention is there some way that we can build these checks in into the into the tool set to where they actually prevent us from having problems and then really looking at how are we going to deal with all the massive amount of data um, because there's so much data that we get inundated with from time to time uh, from different tool sets that we wanted to, is it going to be in the future, are we going to find ways to better uh, share that data and integrate it to where it's not an overwhelming um, effect. And then of course how can technology become less expensive. Yeah, this is a tall order if, if we can do it. We want to improve the interfaces. We want to be preventative when it comes to compliance. We want to 
avoid this world where everyone has a different tool and therefore has different reports and different ways. You know, there's it's very difficult for a prime contractor working with ten different subcontractors all providing data from disparate tools where the data can't readily be normalized. And oh, by the way, we have to do this all in a budget. So I'm about to put the first feedback up from both from the workshop and from the individuals on that previous slide. Now we did make one deal with, with the individuals is we said we're going to use all your feedback but we're going to basically anonymize it where we're not going with few exceptions and we do have a couple exceptions in here but with few exceptions we're not go, going to map the vision with the individual. So know that most of the information we're presenting today comes from these individuals but with a couple exceptions and Gordon's an exception on, on one of his one or two of his items. Um, we're going to uh, uh, we're not going to map them directly to the individual, but you know what? It's not even necessary because 80% of what each of those individuals talked about crossed over into the same points as the others. So without them realizing it and without them co collaborating before the exercise, the feedback was actually very cohesive. So let's go to some of that feedback. Andy, do you want to start off, or do you want me to? Yeah, the uh, first one was a uh, discussion with some of the individuals about how gov some of the government agencies that we talked to are really looking towards moving towards a common tool set. They're going to bring as a discipline from the earned value standpoint the tools that the programs, the government programs are going to use to generate and analyze the data. And then if uh, the programs need uh, specific tools or, or something that's not part of that common tool set, that's something that they may have to go out and, and get on their own. Uh, also, as we're seeing a lot with some of the other topics that I know Tom's talked about with like the UNC FAC, that there's there's a lot of movement towards ease of data integration, the data talking to each other and, and going into different tool sets uh, uh, real easily. Um, Web-based information, being able to pull the information uh, whenever you need it from, from the cloud, which is another topic that we, we talked about, um, we talked about it at a later slide. And then my favorite one is this next bullet which is the in-context instant feedback where the, the data is something that as it's put into the system, you can actually get instant feedback. You can see where it's driving you. It's interactive and it inter it's interactive with uh, other tools such as engineering tools so that you can feed your different tool sets together. You can, they can all talk to each other. You, your engineers might update one um, and that might feed directly into your schedule or it might feed directly to the quantifiable backup data for the percent completer and value technique so that there's not a whole different statusing uh, day. It's all talking to each other and you can see instantly and get that instant feedback on where it is that your project is going um, faster. Yes, and, th and this was one of Gordon's points. And I think when he first brought it up, and, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically to the interactive with engineering tools piece here, not, not just interactive with the user. Um, I don't think when he first brought it up that anyone knew what he was talking about, <laughs> um, but he explained it pretty well. And then he actually expanded on the concept um, at the NDIA PMSC uh, meeting, which followed about a month or two after uh, the spring workshop. And he actually put some pictures up on the screen, and it was really enlightening um, as as far as where he wants to go from where he wants industry go, but from the gut, uh, but from the government perspective. Um, what he did, and, and, and I, unfortunately I don't have that picture here, so I'll have to paint the picture um, uh, uh, with my words, but he, he basically, he had a, he had a picture of an of, of a, uh, Air, Air Force type jet fighter on the screen, and it was a, it was a fighter in, in development, and as there were different variances and different problems and different opportunities, um, he, the physical representation based on a CAD drawing, the physical representation of the engineering model changed colors in different areas so that it could be looked at and understood at the highest levels of government and industry without having to read a CPR or an IPMR type report to understand where the variances are. So really at a basic level, if the wings are green, <laughs> you know, everything's good. But if that avionics package in the cockpit is, is flashing red, you know you've got problems with the avionics modules and then you can drill in from there and understand what the problems are. Well, how do you do that? One of two ways. You either do that with a lot of manual work, which is fun for the first month, kind of fun for the second month, and then by the third month, it's not something that you really want to do manually anymore, um, which is why he introduced the idea of why do these earn value and scheduling and performance measurement tools only talk to each other? How come there's not wider integration in context to the tools that are being used to perform the work. 
it's going to lead to the most timely information and really the most accurate information. And I know it's a concept that Gordon is still still developing, and he's going to need industry support to be able to do it. It's not something he's go going to be able to do on its own. Will his full vision be realized? I don't know. That's part of this, di this EVM 2020 dialogue. But to see that kind of thinking emerging both from government and industry, I know with confidence that we're going to get somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it was really uh, it really caught on as we discussed it as part of the um, the uh, workshop. I mean, everybody just latched on and just loved the idea. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how it how it evolves and if we can even get someplace. Even if we got you know forty percent or or sixty percent of the way, I think it would be a great uh, great addition to the industry. Cool. The, the, right. the next uh, the next bullet is on automated surveillance reviews. Uh, there was a lot of talk about developing into your baseline or part of your tools or part of the, the uh, government agencies whenever data is submitted to them to be able to run it through a series of checks to really tie into and, and focus on where the, where the problem are, where the disconnects are, as opposed to having to wait till some type of, of calendar event like an IBR or surveillance review. So as the tools get smarter, bringing in the data and taking a look at it on a, on a routine basis. Um, and the next one is greater ease of use and time-saving resources such as heat maps. Heat maps was something that was brought up a couple times, and I know it's it's not something that, that's tied directly to our industry. Uh, heat maps have been around for a while, tied to um, investing and stock portfolios. So it's something that where we could bring some best practices from industry or from other other uh, industries to use within the earned value community. Sure, and actually, I would personally was glad to see. Um, some of these topics come up. Um, it's no secret that I work for, you know, one of the top tool vendors in this industry. And actually, what I'm hoping is towards the end of this session uh, today, Andy, once we wrap up the workshop, is show you some of the capabilities that actually exist today, um, which will help get us to the roadmap to 2020 in some of these uh, areas, including the automated surveillance reviews, uh, the heat maps, and um, and some of that interactivity uh, as well. And the other component of it also that we heard repeated multiple times was really tying the data to a risk-based approach as opposed to being inundated with so much data. Looking at your data to, to, to identify where the key elements are, like as we talked about with the interactive up top, but tying it also to risk. You know, are we going to spend a lot of time focusing on a, on a 20K issue when there's, there's, there's large areas over there, or the 20K could have a high risk component of it, and we really need to dive down into that. So really tying in this risk-based approach to the an analysis is, uh, is a key component that we need to move towards. Yeah, that was brought up by each of those six individuals uh, almost, almost verbatim in those exact words. This, to me, falls into the, into the very uh, true and appropriate cliche of you know, work smarter, not harder. And if you're doing a risk-based analysis, you're focusing on the areas um, that, um, that could affect you the most and uh, potentially undermine your project. And I'm already hearing from DCMA, from the NDIA meetings and some of the other sessions, is they're going to a risk-based approach and, and getting away from their calendar-based approach where they just routinely look at the same areas on a 12-month calendar. They're going to the approach where they're going to look at each program as an individual entity as it should be looked at, understand what some of the key areas that can undermine project success are, and spend the most time on those areas and minimize time in the areas that aren't going to send the project off the rails. Yeah. And the last uh, bullet that we have here is uh, some, some areas where we discuss the fact that we really need to make sure that the people that we have doing the anal uh, analysis and running the tools has a, a strong fu fundamental or foundational perspective. They have the skills, the fundamentals on good planning and execution, and not, not just somebody who's really good at running the tool set. Agreed. So. This is just a subset of some of the responses we got. We got, you know, it was a lot of interactive, a lot of people we talked to. So these were kind of the key components that we pulled out from the response from the, the thought leaders in the industry and from the workshop um, that we held. Terrific. Yeah, we had about 25 to 30 individuals in the workshop on top of the, the six or seven individuals that we talked to in preparing the material. So, and actually we're going to talk at the end about um, how, how the show goes on to other conferences and how you can get involved. Um, so, okay, let's go ahead to software. Um, we talked about the software industry. 
Um, will the industry have to consolidate um, at some point? Uh, in some of the areas where earned value is most prevalent, like in the defense industry, um, the main players in the industry have had to consolidate and, and really you know, keep their head above water. And is that going to ripple through to the software industry? And will we see consolidation there? This is a speculative exercise. No one knows uh, for sure. Um, but what people um, have, were opinionated about is are the software vendors acting appropriately? <laughs> are they keeping tabs on the industry, keeping tabs on each other, and making sure that we're moving forward in a common direction? Hey, competition is good, and it's important that the industry have competition, but it can't undermine where we're all trying to go, which is better data in real time you know, to, to come up with risk-based you know, solutions. Um, so that, um, again, we ask the speculative question, can vendors do that? Can they make money by b focusing on two areas, serving customers with their current reporting needs today on their projects, but also evolving their products for the purposes of A, competitive advantage, and then B, evolving to where the, the expectations of reporting are going to be, not just where they are today. And again, to that point, can vendors support those regulatory regulatory requirements, FAA, DCMA, Department of Energy, civil agencies, etc. Can can are there too many different regulatory requirements out there to even be supported by a handful of vendors? So I'll talk a little bit about UNC here, Andy, and then I'll I'll turn it over to you. Um, every single one that we talked to mentioned UNC fact um, because it is a very exciting way that the industry is going to get commonality across tools to where tools can still differentiate themselves but at the end of the day we're reducing that Tower of Babel effect by having the tools output in the same language. Right now PDFs are prominent because your reports depending on the tool it might come out in Excel, it might come out directly in PDF format, it might come out as a Word document, it might be formatted differently UNC FAC gets us to a proven standard, an XML based standard across the board. So the tools can focus on best practice, complying with regulations, and getting the user functional in the quickest, most efficient way possible while producing the report that is going to be able to be interpreted by the con prime contractor and or the government customer. And that's why we say here, it will steer the tools towards analysis rather than having to differentiate, differentiate themselves on the strength of the reporting. Yeah, Tom, and I think this is also something that we're, where people had indicated, that, well, UNC FACT is a, is a good start. There's a lot of different ways where we can use the, the foundation of UNC FACT, electronic data interchange, where the data can talk between different systems, which goes back to what we talked about before of how the tool sets become almost interactive and they communicate better with the engineering tools so that we can almost develop the whole standard, uh, different standards or whatever between within the industry to where all the tools can talk to each other and feed the information almost in real time. Exactly. UNC FACT has its roots, or really it's a type of EDI implementation, which has been used for decades now between companies and in all industries. I, I, I used it heavily in the telecommunications um, industry, and it's just a standard way of communicating between businesses and software tools. So why not have this UNC FACT methodology proliferate beyond the scheduling, earned value, and reporting tools that it's being looked at today, and why can't the engineering tool be supplying information through this type of interchange format to the scheduling tool, ultimately to the cost tool, then to the customer from an analytical perspective. We're, we're doing it well if we implement UNC FACT in these cost and scheduling tools. We're doing it great if the tools that feed information to those tools are communicating in a standard, potentially UNC fact as well. Yeah. Which kind of leads us to our next next bullet here where we kind of look at the benchmarking uh, and it, as part of a way to where we can get more useful uh, metrics as part of, say, and what one threshold that came out was the dynamic context into the thresholds. But what does that mean? It means instead of having just like a bl blanket threshold that you apply across uh, your your variance is you know 10% and 100,000. 
Instead, what you, you do is you may look at the lifestyle or the not the life cycle of where you are a part of that the program phase, and your thresholds change as you move to a more mature or to production phase. Also, you may look at where, from a benchmarking standpoint, where you run into problems in the past. You consistently run pro into problems in the software effort or an in integration, and so your thresholds might be more tighter whenever you're in, in those areas as opposed to the program management discipline where it's mostly level of effort. So instead of just having some type of blanket approach, we benchmark, we look at the history of, of the performance of maybe the contractor or the industry as a whole and apply that in a dynamic way. Exactly. And, you know, this is great uh, for those interested in statistical process control and parametrics. I might be hitting red on a particular metric all the time, but I might have that one project that was still in red, but it was an outlier and it was better compared to the others. So if there's an area that I've consistently struggled in, I want the system to let me know where it sees a light at the end of the tunnel and alert me to that, rather than just continuing to show me red. I might get tired of seeing red after a while and not even look at it anymore. If the thresholds in the systems are dynamic and can adjust to the realities of my business, I can understand, isolate that project that did something very well, much better than I've done it before, and then try and bring that magic, find out what created that magic, and try and bring that magic to the other projects that I'm executing. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And the IPMR did, I know, just lays the foundation or the start where it's changed, started to change the dynamic of the way we were looking at variance thresholds. Maybe in the future we can take it another step forward. Agreed. The last bullet here that we had on the software responses was compliant checks need to be built into the information development process, not just measured on the back end. And really this is a key component as our, as our tool sets evolve. Um, we can start to incorporate uh, you know, data integrity checks where maybe in the scheduling system you, you get a flag if, or a, a marker if you, if you schedule a task that's you know, a year long. You know, something to where now the, we need to really look at short-term duration or 44 days as part of DCMA. Maybe that's something that can be built into it as the planner or as the CAM is actually scheduling that. They can start to get instant feedback on things that might trip a problem down the road in, in a compliance review or, or maybe it's not, just, it's not a best practice. Yes, yeah, U universal agreement. And this theme, it, it's almost like it comes up in one way or another in all of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Let's talk about the cloud. Yeah, Everybody the, likes to talk about the cloud, <laughs> but what does it mean and, and how can it help us in 2020? Yeah, and I was just going to say this is a big hot topic, not, not just in, in our industry, but I mean everywhere you, you've looked at in the past couple of years, everybody's talking about the cloud and how can it... Um, how can it change all the industries out there right now? Yeah, one of the frustrations I've had for a long time is um, in a lot of businesses and, and you know, earned value management here in the U.S., we, we tend to talk about the defense industry, is each contractor really needs to build their own infrastructure. You need to have your own IT department, your own, you know, your own, you know, almost like your own data center. And that's very expensive. And in the environment we're in now, you know, we all talk about it almost every day, is you've got to do more with less. And can you get this infrastructure piece completely out of the equation? And that's what we pose to the audience. Yeah, and many of the uh, thought leaders that we spoke to didn't have a lot of strong opinion on this when we spoke to them, but we did dedicate some time of it in the workshop. And it was really in an interesting um, discussion that we had because there was some talk about maybe, well, maybe the government could get in the business of, of creating a secure uh, cloud infrastructure or repository to where all the the um, the contractors can then store their data there and know that it's secure. But then, and while at first that was something that a lot of people jumped onto, it just it didn't really stick. It kind of went different directions. And one for at the beginning, it was something that people really thought was a great idea. But towards the end, the government's like, I don't think we want to get into that business of of uh, managing your data. So, well, yeah, yeah. Paul, Gordon was in there as the, you know, as the representative of the entire US government and uh, you know, almost said, someone, you know, basically stood up and said, "Well, why wouldn't, you know, the government do this?" You know, and it, it was it was in good humor, it was in good context, it wasn't confrontational. And then a few other people latched on and said, "Yeah, that would save us a lot of trouble if the government who already has a secure government network were to host and be the hosting cloud hosting provider." for the secure information that's being developed by the 
by the contractors. Now, the government would have to take on a ton of infrastructure. It would need to be funded by industry. I mean, this is something that could happen, but um, the 25 or 26 of us in the room with one government representative weren't going to be able to develop this concept uh, much further. To me, Andy, this was really where I felt like the brainstorming was working because we, we, you and I hadn't talked about that. It hadn't come up during any of those six interviews, but then when we got more smart people in the room together, some, some of these why not ideas like the government, you know, hosting the cloud for contractors, you know, no one could say why not, you know, Gordon was able to say from the govern, government perspective, probably not, <laughs> but uh, it was it was interesting. We we had to eventually move off of this one because you know we could have talked for four hours about what this would look like. But it was really symbolic of the good um, out of left field ideas that were coming in that weren't easily dismissible. Yeah, and it really focused around security issues, which at first you know people were like, oh, you got to, it's not going to happen where we can be secure. But then as we we discussed it more. The security issues are things that we, we could probably be overcome. It's just a confidence issue that where we'd have to really test it out and vet it out. And it really opened up if the government's not willing to do it, it's possible like a third party or someone out there in the industry might be willing to do it as a, a business model. Well, and, th and that's exactly right. And there are ways for data providers to become uh, secured and classified as secured with regard to uh, government projects. So the idea might not be implemented the way it was discussed in the room, but to be able to get people to zero infrastructure would be a huge differentiator for a private data firm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's. You want, you want to go ahead, Andy? Go ahead. Regulatory. Yeah. We, um, as you might recall from some of the interviews that we, or the thought leaders, we talked to uh, Gordon Kranz uh, with Parka and um, Jim Henderson with DCMA. So, you know, regulatory is something that's been a big big component of the industry the last uh, five or seven years, or at least a couple of years in my, my career is where I really focused on. So it was really interesting to, to talk to some of these these uh, leaders in the industry to kind of see where, where their thoughts were, were heading down, down the road. And where we really focused on, what we talked about from uh, time to time during the, the conversation today, was really seeing if how or if government's really interested in doing the automated compliance audits or automatic compliance checks as part of the data. And that was something that was really seemed to be agreed upon. That that's where the industry is heading, but uh, you know it's not there yet. Also, the increased focus on the ability to execute the project versus just routine compliance checking. We need to remember that the industry that we're earned value is a program management uh, tool and best practice. So we always need to keep in the in back of our mind that we're trying to execute programs here, not just getting out a report at the end of the month. Yeah, the and, old question is, okay, you have a great schedule. Can you deliver on it? <laughs> and yeah. and how, how will the tools, how, how do we do that in, in 2020? Go ahead, proceed. Yeah, and then uh, as we've talked about many times, can compliance be built into the baseline and the forecast? And that's something to where I think we're starting to see the, um, the genesis of that as being built into, as we're creating the data, that we have some type of checks in place. Um, and then you know, as we sometimes try to simplify, simplify things, Will simplification remove checks and balances? Yeah. Will in an attempt to be leaner, will we create blind spots for ourselves where we think we're doing it a risk-based fashion and hitting hitting the high notes, but then one of those under the radar type items comes and and undermines our project. Um, so this this that, first item, Andy, Andy, wasn't this one of the one of the few instances? where there was disagreement between some of the players that we talked to from the government perspective. Yeah, and when we talked about to some of the government, government people, we, we brought up the idea of um, uh, self-assessment or self-validation, and it, it, where the, the, the vendor or the, the, the um, contractors take on the responsibility to verify and to validate, possibly with some third-party um, support. And you know when we talked to some people within the within the government, they they supported that. You know, obviously they would 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 keep uh, an eye on it, built in some checks, and make sure that the contractors are doing what they said they're doing. But the idea of uh, allowing the contractors to do that self-assessment or self or self-validation versus the rigor of the government auditing, the government auditing and the government validation uh, mechanism. 
And so some people thought it was a good idea or a possible that in the future we could develop that framework where others thought, no, absolutely not. So it was really a great discussion point that we had between the different, the different individuals. Yeah, there's that next point again, the automation and the risk-based approach. Again, with regard to regulatory, universal agreement on that. Yeah, it brought up time and time and time again of everybody in agreeing that we need to really take a risk-based approach as part of the, uh, the industry. And that's really the same as this item, which is the compliance issues, which could impact the ability for the project to be delivered, not just compliance issues because a document didn't have the right seven columns in it. You know. Exactly. And then also a key component within the industry specifically was the reciprocity of validation, where when one company gets validated as part of a, a DOD contract, that the other, other government agency, FAA um, and others, recognize that validation so you don't have to get validated by multiple government agencies. Yeah, you know, everyone keeps saying that, and it's almost like everyone's waiting for somebody else to go ahead and then agree to be reciprocal with another. You know, we're, we're seeing shades of it, um, and, and we're seeing reviews that don't have to take place because the audit agency has learned that another agency that they trust has, re has, has already done the review, but I haven't seen anything institutional in this regard. Everyone agrees it needs to be done, but it's almost like everyone's waiting for everybody else. <laughs> Yeah, Tom, do you want to take the next one about the differences between commercial and government? Because my background is mostly on the government side. Yeah, the, the, um, and this is almost a challenge to industry and a challenge to the tool vendors is uh, you've got contractors um, who work both commercial and government contracts. In fact, Andy, you and I both spent time at Orbital Sciences uh, Corporation where they had this, th this same uh, – dilemma where you manage and report on a government project in a certain way and on, a, on commercial projects you might have some other priorities you might have fewer requirements in one area but profit might be the complete profit management might be the complete bottom line maybe there's some learning to be done between all sides in that case in other words for the commercial markets to understand why the government looks at things a certain way and for the government to understand why their programs aren't being managed exactly the same way that a commercial program would be. You'd think the goals and motives would be exactly the same. Now the requirements have branched off and there are more stringent requirements when you're doing government. But if we have to do it for lower cost but still get the same results, maybe there's some lessons to be learned. So maybe some of that falls on the contractors, but maybe some of that falls on the tool vendors as well who have been supporting clients that support both the commercial and government markets. Now, we haven't gone far enough into this exercise to, to have done the research to know specifically what government could learn from commercial and commercial could learn from government, but we know enough to know that there's different requirements, there's different requirements for a reason, and now it's time to find out what the, what the gaps between those two are. Maybe in 2020, there's one way of doing this that satisfies both commercial and government, and it's lean and isn't burdensome to the program. Yeah, and the government's not the only um, only uh, person or agency out there that do these large projects. I mean, there's a, a large commercial uh, construction projects, oil and natural gas, billion-dollar projects, where they've got to deliver on time, on on cost, and they don't have a lot of the uh, burgess, um, regulatory components of it. So there's, there's a lot of different agents, there are industries out there that do large projects that where we can learn a lot from them. Exactly. The, the rhetorical question becomes, if I have a billion-dollar project for government uh, versus you know, a commercial drilling job, why would it be managed differently? Why would I have different reporting between the two? When we can answer that question, we'll be down, we can get ourselves down to a single model of, of, of a billion-dollar project regardless of who it's for. Exactly. Final item here, the windshield view. Um, this is a smarter dashboard. Um, th this was another one of those topics that, that the team really got around um, at, the, uh, at the recent uh, workshop, which traditionally dashboards and lots of software and packages and companies have, have, da have, have dashboards. But the windshield view, that's very specific. That's looking out of the front windshield of your car, not the side windows, not the back window, not the dashboard in your car, but specifically what's going down the road. Is there a tractor trailer up there who's kind of weaving around? Do I need to back off and stay away from that? Or do I have a clear passage you know, on my, uh, on my trip? 
And to me, that comes down to what you're measuring. It's one thing to have a dashboard. It's another thing entirely to have the right predicted indicators on that dashboard so that you can see with as much advance as possible what's going to hurt you. Everyone agreed. Future discussion. In fact, the uh, NDIA has an entire subcommittee devoted to the predictive measures guide. And I would see the outcome of that, the, the in-work predictive measures guide, really becoming the foundation of this wind, windshield view and something that tool vendors should take notice of because it's going to become the expectation. What I loved about it when we discussed this during the um, during the, the workshop is the fact that everybody latched on the windshield view. We brought up many, many times. We'd point back to it, and eventually it was something we were putting a TM on top of it where we were going to trademark windshield view because <laughs> it's something down the road I'm sure someone's going to pick up on. It, it is, and seeing that linkage, the potential linkage to the predictive measures guide, it's just further emphasis that we're talking about the right things, and the more noise we make, making noise about it at this forum, they're making noise about it at the NDIA, we're going to get it. We just have to keep the spirit alive. We have to keep talking about it, and we have to then understand what goes on the windshield, and then the tool vendors need to take notice and need to implement it. Yeah, another topic we discussed was uh, the contract types. Are they going to change in, in the year 2020? And You know, this is something I hear a lot. Oh, we're going to move more towards firm fixed price contracts. Well, we did that in the past. We went to more firm fixed price contracts, came back to cost plus, and it's a reciprocal component. Nobody really knew what the future of this was. Uh, no strong opinions were really expressed. They just know that that it's something that when, when we have cost plus contracts and large contracts uh, that we're going to have to continue using earned value. It was a real surprise to me that there weren't stronger opinions, but like you say, it's been so cyclical in the past that uh, I don't think anyone's willing to stand up and drive this. I think they're just willing to sit back and wait and see what happens and be, re and be ready for it. And I think the key becomes adaptation. How quickly can I turn my enterprise from a cost reimbursable contract type to a fixed, fixed price mode? And, and that's where everyone agreed that they need to be ready to turn on a dime with. Um, another topic we didn't have too much discussion on um, was lean EV. Um, it comes up every once in a while, you know, EV light, what would it look like? And those who are more regulatory oriented say, hey, you can't take away any of these criteria that go into a proper earned value management model. Uh, the government made some good points and said, well, we work with universities who, can, who simply cannot afford and will not be able to execute projects if they do have the full EV requirements. We simply won't get the deliverable in that case if we do require it. So there was agreement that there does need to be um, some sense of scalability, particularly for nonprofit and universities, where the government's lucky <laughs> and fortunate, it feels very fortunate to get what they're getting from these organizations, and they do not want to be the first ones to stand up and impose restrictions and impose reporting requirements when they feel like they're very fortunate for what they're getting. Anything to add on that one, Andy? Yeah, I just it was just an area that I hadn't really thought about. You know, the universities and nonprofits, and you know, one of the one of the uh, interviewers actually mentioned the fact that sometimes for the universities, the accounting systems are just not set up to be able to be compliant to the 32 criteria. So it's just a component of hey, if we want to use these these uh, these centers, we we just have to be a little bit more flexible. But it also comes into a component we talked about prior about how we can integrate with the different industries and, and grab the best practices. So I think this is going to be something that in the, in the future there's going to be a lot of focus on and trying to see how we can uh, benchmark and leverage across different industries. Agreed. Some of the other topics that came up, I, I'm going to speed us up a little bit here because I want to make sure we have time uh, at least for a few questions. Um, the term of earned value management. And, and government is, is big on this because earned value management can have a negative connotation because it's, for right or wrong, it, it's, it's sometimes viewed as, as a burden. And really, um, all of the government folks we've talked to want the term to transform into a component of good integrated program management, program performance management, whatever you want to call it, rather than being seen as this niche within program management. There's much more to what we're talking about than earned value management. We're talking about integration with, with engineering tools through common data interfaces. This is much broader than calculating you know, schedule performance and cost performance index on a month, monthly basis and plotting them on a chart. Um, yeah, and it, the, the, compo the real genesis of that was with the, in the start of the uh, IPMR guide, the Integrated Program Management Report, where we now starting to integrate between costs and schedule as opposed to being separate. 
agreed. Uh, integration and risk-based decision making. We talked we talked about this plenty. Um, can EV survive without executive support? And I think that's viewed as critical to understanding and it proliferating the understanding that earned value is part of good uh, part of a good program management practice. It's not something that you can simply cut off. <laughs> oh, we don't do EVM any EVM anymore. It, it, the 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 message to executives needs to be well that would mean that you're not really doing quality program management anymore and every executive would agree that they need to do quality program management um, another topic that came up was unrealistic schedule and budgets on awarded contracts um, contractors need to be more competitive than ever and are they being so competitive where we're getting into the bounds of unrealism and then what do we do about that how do we fix that so that the moment a contract gets awarded, the CPI is already you know under 1.0. It also leads to the fact that you know our value really isn't effective whenever you just sign up to just these unrealistic targets. When you sign up to a schedule that's that's, that's months, you just can't deliver to. You know you're going to start seeing the industries drop and drop and drop, and the program manager say, oh, I'm not getting any useful information from the earned value. Well, it's because there's just there's it's just completely unrealistic for what you started with what you set up with. Agreed. Um, I'm going to put. We're going to do three about three more things. One, I'm putting some contact information up up on the board for Andy and myself. We'd love to hear your thoughts, or if you're, or, or if we don't get time to get to your questions today, um, you know, make note of our our email addresses here. We'll be sending the presentation out as well. So if you miss them right now, you'll be able to catch them um, on the on the recording or on the presentation um, itself. I'm going to show a little bit of some of those items that we have in some of our tools today which help address some of the things that Andy and I talked about and then we're going to open it up uh, to questions uh, as well. So let me jump over here. And while you're doing that, Tom, I just want to yeah. mention the fact that we, we're trying to continue this. We, um, I submitted a paper or a, for a, a workshop at the IPM conference uh, that's coming up um, and in, in November and you know if, if we get accepted, um, I would love to see some more people come out and it's a lot, lot uh, larger of a conference, and we're hoping to continue this and get a lot more feedback, and really maybe start to 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 uh, bound some of these into hopefully some things that we can really possibly work on in the future. Absolutely, and I'm going to put their website up on the screen in a few minutes. No one's been accepted on the agenda yet, so we can't say for sure that we're going to have our our workshop session there. But I, I sure hope that we do, and I sure hope some of the folks that are on the phone uh, with us today are able to uh, participate in that session. I'll be putting that site up. It's a pretty easy site name to remember, and I'll put that up on the screen in a couple minutes. Um, just for a couple minutes here, I want to talk about some of the things that I got excited about um, as people were telling us our vision of 2020 because some of the items that they were talking about we have today in the Dell Tech Acumen software suite and hey I, I work I work for Dell Tech I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of these things that we can um, that we can do today that help us get towards the real-time analytics I've got a heat map up on the screen here uh, for instance where I'm looking at um, the size of the block is budgeted cost and then the color represents total float. So rather than looking at these in, as line items in a project listing where I could kind of look down and look where there's larger costs by the size of the number and then look at my float, I can take this pictorial and maybe this is part of that windshield view you know that the industry evolves to where if these budgeted costs, if these items that have the most budgeted cost also have the worst negative float like EPC design does here as my biggest budgeted area, but it's also in red. And I think if I click here, it tells me my total float is about negative 91, um, uh, negative 91 days right here on my listing. Well, the most significant chunk of cost in my program is one of the latest items on my program. What's the, what is that going to do to my SPI and my CPI? They're going to get blown out of the water, basically, whether they are now or not. If I go to my iron value metrics, they might show as 1.0 and 1.0, but guess what? There's trouble on the horizon with this item, while some of these other big budget items are in green. Now there's another item here that I need to look at as well. So here's some of that heat map approach where someone who might not understand earned value and, and schedule quality from a conceptual standpoint, I could explain this to them pretty quickly to, hey, we've got to look at these largest blocks that have the most, <laughs> that, that have the most red in them. So that's one way to look at information very quickly. Um, what I have up here on the screen in this main area is the DCMA 14 point assessment. 
which has emerging recognition as one of the best and quickest ways to monitor quality and drive quality uh, in a project schedule. Here's the 14 criteria by, by year for this project and then also for the project as a whole. And I can very quickly, in real time, drill in on any one of these items, for instance, lags, and see all the activities where I've used lags. By the way, it's in red, which means I have more lags than DCMA standard is comfortable with. So now I can begin to make an assessment of which of these lags can maybe go away. Now another thing we talked about was risk-based assessment. And here I've got my current project schedule, and it's telling me at the top line how I comply with these different metrics. In fact, it doesn't really look very good. My overall score is about 7%. Now, coded in this schedule, I have a series of locations. Some locations might be higher risk and have not performed well in the past, and some might be lower risk. So now I have my 14-point assessment out here on the right-hand side, but it's by location. And I can target. Here's where we get to that risk-based approach. Now, none of these have done very well. One of these has done, done better than the others. So maybe I can put offshore whose tasks are in the future and score higher than the others. Maybe I can put them aside for a moment and focus my beams, focus my compliance checking on the domestic and golf areas, which have active tasks right now and are not scoring very well in the DCMA 14-point assessment. So these are just a few examples of where we've got capabilities today in what we call the Dell Tech Acumen Suite, where we can get to the real-time analytics, we can do it in a risk-based fashion, and get closer to that windshield view that everybody was talking about at the workshop session. Now, this isn't, this, the point of today's session wasn't a tool demonstration, but it was to let you know, we feel that there's a lot of hope, and we feel that there is readily the capability to get to many of the concepts that the group has been talking about and evolving as we look towards 2020. We're seeing the hooks for that today. Um, a couple items on the UNC fact. Right here, we've got interchange, both import and export, with the UNC fact format. And we even, let's see, let's go to, I'm going to go to a couple of websites here. Uh, right out on the Dell Tech Acumen homepage, uh, which can be accessed through DellTech.com or ProjectAcumen.com, as, as Dell Tech, as you may know, has recently acquired Acumen. Um, we have a schedule index calculator um, here on our homepage, which will let you know some quality information about your schedule. It'll also convert your schedule to UNC Fact XML as well, right here uh, from the website. So definitely check this out. I'll put this address up, up at the end as well. And let's talk about that IPM conference. Um, this is a great um, event where the industry uh, gets together. It's in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, this year it's coming up November 18th and 20th. IPMconference.org is that address uh, that I talked about. And uh, it's, it's worth checking out. We're hoping to be one of the participating workshops at that session uh, as well. Um, also, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, uh, if you go to, uh, there's a couple other uh, great events coming up. If you go to DellTech.com, you can learn all about Dell Tech Insight, which is coming up even sooner. Um, I'll be appearing there as well, October 14th to 17th. Oh, it, 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 it flipped past. And then also Acumen, as you may know, um, is having uh, the Acumen um, Summit, which is coming up in the end of September. September, the, if you go to the Acumen page and you can go read all about uh, the Acumen Annual Summit as well. Okay, uh, Brad, Brad Arterbury, are you out there and, and have, any, uh, have any good questions come in during this course of the session? Hey Tom, yeah, this is Brad. We had we had several good questions come come in. Um, so uh, first question uh, around Agile, um, do you guys see closer integration between EVM and Agile in the future in 2020 uh, or the opposite? Andy, you are the Agile master. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I worked a lot with the Agile in the last couple of years. It, Agile, for those who, who may not be familiar, is a, is a software discipline, a spiral integration, where it really tries to um, be more 
more fluid with the requirements and being able to work really on what the customer is interested in from the software component um, in real time and try to get those out of the way, especially the big hitter, so that they then can really focus on the functionality of the, of the, the tool set. We, we've, uh, I've seen some companies who, who are looking at trying to incorporate the best principles of Agile from, um, you know, from cradle to grave as part of their project as something that they can integrate as part of software, um, mechanical, hardware, uh, and so on. So just even evolving out of, out of the software area. And at the uh, last conference where we did our workshop, there was a whole track on agile development and how it can be integrated more with, with earned value. Some of the larger per, uh, companies out there are doing it and doing it well. I think the, the big component is, is to do true agile, you have to give up a lot of your earned value fundamental pr principles to allow current period changes and so on with, within the baseline and a little bit lo looser scope definition where if you want to still stay true to your own value and be, especially if you're in a program that's got uh, DCMA uh, surveillance requirements, you, you kind of have to compromise on both ends. So yes, I, I think it's here to stay. I think it's, it's evolving. I think there's a lot of um, different areas where we're starting to see it go move beyond software. Um, and I still think that it's something that's um, got some, some ways to w we have to answer on how we can do it, especially on those programs that have the uh, earned value requirements for, for auditing. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, so next question was actually several questions um, that I'll sort of paraphrase. They're around the same idea. Um, when you guys looked at the sort of technical wish list that came out, um, what tools are available today that satisfy some of those uh, technical requirements? And then the, the technical requirements that tools don't exist to satisfy, are those things being um, looked at for development of the tools and future capabilities. Uh, yeah, I'll take that one, Brad. Um, as as I uh, demonstrated with the Fuse um, architecture that we have here under under Dell Tech, uh, we do have a lot of the capabilities that were discussed. I'm not going to sit here and try to fool everyone and say, oh yeah, we've got 2020 covered. No, there's no way to do that now because even if we felt like we had. We're always, you know, we're always moving forward, and all the tool vendors that I've seen who are who are still players in the market today, they're moving forward as well. The key becomes scalability, and being able to configure the tools on a dime for when the government comes out next year. I'm I'm making this up, but the government could potentially come out next year and say all projects are now firm fixed price projects. I remember John McCain a few years ago when he was running for president. He mentioned that specifically as part of his platform. Well, he didn't win the election, so we didn't move in that direction. But that can, there's potential for that to happen, especially with, you know, with an election year coming up. So it becomes tools being able to support a malleable process. How do you do that? You have those predictive measures, and you have the ability, like I conveniently, like I have with the metrics editor um, here in the Acumen environment, where without having to change solutions, I can work with the tool vendor or work on my own if I need to, to scale the current solution into that malleable solution that can support the new contract type or ha what everyone's talking about, having to do more with less, taking a risk-based approach. So how to use these metrics, how to control my windshield, my dashboard, to be able to hone in on the areas that are going to be most important to me in 2016, even though I'm working with a tool that was developed in 2013. Okay, great. And then kind of follow on question to that, um, how can the vendors share a common ground in tool development while still maintaining competition? Um, what I see firsthand, and I, I can obviously only talk about my own experience, Andy, you, you might want to chime in too, but um, I see the vendors participating at the table, at the conferences, at the webcasts like today, and really being part and engaged in the regulatory um, environment, at the table with government and industry, at the table at the NDIA conferences, which was maybe originally geared more towards the defense industry, um, the, the, I'm sorry, the contractors meeting with government. But there I am sitting as a tool vendor alongside all these other tool vendors. We have our own products. We have our own ways of doing things. But when Gordon stands up and says UNCFAC is the way forward, we all sit there and nod our heads. 
the vendors that don't participate and aren't at the table are going to be left in the dust. There's no question in my mind about it. All right, thanks, Tom. So that actually uh, uh, consolidates all the questions that we received. Okay. Well, terrific, Brad. Thanks for helping us out. Uh, um, I, Andy and I never would have been able to monitor the questions um, and, and uh, deliver the presentation at the same time, so I truly appreciate your support today. And An Andrew, uh, thank you very much for kind of doing the uh, play-by-play the -play today on, on what we did and, and what we developed. Um, any, any final words, Andy? Any, any recommendations? No, I, I think just my, my, last, um, my last comment is just, hey, if you've got some ideas, if you've got some other thoughts on where the industry might be heading, if uh, you just want to know and, and keep up to date on, on future information on, on how we're, as, as we continue on with, with this topic, because I think, Tom, I think this is something where we're going to revisit. We may not go to every conference and, and discuss it, but, you know, we might revisit it in a couple of years, and, and ideally one day we might, we might publish some of the, the thoughts in, in some type of earned value publication. So send us an email, and uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to get some correspondence and some ideas and some feedback. Yeah, exactly. Your, and your point's 100% right. There's no such thing as too much uh, participation. Um, we, we welcome it. Um, we had a great session um, at the, uh, the spring uh, EVM World Conference. Like, like we said, we hope to take the show on the road again to the November uh, conference, but we hope to also keep it alive um, in, in webcasts and conversations and truly get to the point where it's not a speculative exercise or a theoretical exercise but it's a very tangible exercise where we get everyone's thoughts on the table, come to consensus, feed that information back to the tool vendors, back to the companies who are developing processes, and get to a better place. If earned value management or integrated program management looks the same in 2020 as it did 10 years ago, we, we haven't done well. Maybe we've done okay, but uh, I, I think it'd be more exciting. Uh, the more we move forward, the more we can do, the more we can do with less and um, really create that next generation process analyst and system to be able to support that. So with that, thank you everyone. We look forward to hearing from you. I'll put our contact information here and then we also have our website and other resources that you can find. And uh, really don't hesitate to reach out to us and thank you for your participation today. Take care everyone.